Okay, well, hello everybody. Um, so we're going to take a, a rapid uh, trip through stimulants and um, only cocaine or methamphetamine. We're not going to be discussing caffeine or um, MDMA, ecstasy, or um, any of a number of other uh, stimulants, but really just focus on uh, these. And some slides I'm going to be skipping over because you can just look at your handout <clears throat> for um, for them, and there's really well, way too much um, there. I wanted to just provide some information in the form of your handout for completeness, but not have a chance to, you know, verbally go over all of it. Um, and so cocaine is one of, um, you know, many, many drugs that comes from natural plant sources. And in this case, uh, erythroxylon coca is um, a plant that uh, grows um, in the um, Andes. Its uh, leaves are harvested and have been for thousands of years. Um, generally, the way that's been used by indigenous peoples is uh, by crushing up the leaves and um, chewing them and then much in the same way that we instruct people to use uh, nicotine gum uh, to chew the leaves and then place them between the, um, the gum and the cheek so that there's transmucosal absorption. And um, this absorption is, uh, uh, can be aided by um, altering the pH of the um, saliva and uh, indigenous peoples in, um, in the Andes use uh, sticks that have been covered with calcium carbonate, with lime, and then will rub the insides of their cheeks with the lime to um, alter the uh, mucosal pH to better absorb. Uh, but the amount of cocaine that's in these leaves is very, very small compared to the amount of cocaine that's available in powdered cocaine, even with the adulterants that are often added in uh, <coughs> contemporary life. So, you know, mo more modern history of um, cocaine, of course, involves um, um, psychiatry. Uh, Freud uh, wrote his um, very famous text that, on uh, cocaine in uh, 1884, around the time that um, its local anesthetic use uh, was first being applied. Cocaine had been isolated about um, 30 years earlier in Germany. Um, and then cocaine, as you probably know, really had a very active uh, commercial life as a patent medication um, in all sorts of preparations, uh, syrups, tonics, um, uh, injected, uh, orally used um, for uh, depression, to pep people up for energy. And the most famous patent medicine preparation was, of course, Coca-Cola, which had the, uh, as the advertisements of the day um, announced, it had the, uh, the wonderful properties of the uh, coca leaf and the, uh, you know, the other wonderful properties of the cola nut. Um, and even after the Harrison Act um, in 1914, the uh, Coca-Cola company actually used uh, decoconized coca leaves for flavoring. Uh, but those were removed some time back on. Maybe somebody here knows. I don't, I don't know when. You can't find any evidence of the cocaine story at the Coca-Cola Museum in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you Must be an oversight. Yeah, yeah. You talk to the guys who are there, and they profess to know nothing about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Um, so there have been many, uh, there have been a number of, of waves, as with many drugs are really, you know, highs and lows, uh, so to speak, in terms of their, their use epidemics in the 20s with cocaine. And then the current epidemic really goes back now 40, 40 45 years or so um, with uh, the rise of intranasal powder cocaine use in the mid-1970s and really getting into middle class, uh, often white, uh, educated, uh, young um, social circles um, with 
the um, use of uh, uh, the of an inhalable form of cocaine beginning in the mid and late 70s in the form of uh, freebase cocaine. Um, and um, the, uh, the freebase form, um, I actually may get to that but later. I, um, I think I want to say a word about methamphetamine and epidemiology. I think, um, yeah, we'll get into the different forms of, uh, of cocaine. But anyway, freebase cocaine, which was uh, a sort of a home chemistry lab process uh, whereby um, you could take powdered cocaine, dissolve it in various solvents, remove the uh, hydrochloride, and leave the free base cocaine. And I'll get into why that's important in a, in a moment. Then that got uh, changed to being able to buy pre-free base cocaine in the form of rocks of crack cocaine. Um, with amphetamine, uh, it doesn't grow as a plant, um, although there are uh, various uh, similar um, stimulant-like molecules that are that do uh, come from natural sources, but amphetamine was synthesized um, shortly after the um, the local anesthetic properties of cocaine were discovered in the mid 1880s. Um, so synthesis in 1887, methamphetamine 1918, um, first clinical availability in the U.S. of Methamphetamine was through inhalers, such as the Vicks inhaler. And if you look at a Vicks inhaler today, you, I forget the exact chemical name. It doesn't say uh, L-methamphetamine, but it's the same molecule, just with a different chemical name. Um, what's key there is that the L form of methamphetamine is not uh, CNS psychoactive, although it's still has decongestant properties, so peripherally it's active. It's the D form of uh, amphetamine and the D form of methamphetamine that are um, central nervous system active. Uh, so 1932 inhaler, but and then also in the 30s, the use of amphetamines as antidepressants um, became prevalent, and, and one of the major antidepressants um, in the 30s and 40s were amphetamines. Um, there was a growth in uh, the use of amphetamines for weight control in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and probably the peak of the first amphetamine, and it was an amphetamine, not a methamphetamine epidemic, was in the early 1960s in the United States, after which, uh, by the late 60s, amphetamine and methamphetamine use really declined, and the reasons for that aren't entirely clear to me, perhaps. Um, more uh, strict legal uh, and more strict prescription information, uh, prescribing regulations rather. Um, <clears throat> but I remember when I was in college uh, in the 60s, um, there was still the availability of um, not just all forms of prescription amphetamine that people, just like today, kids you know, use Adderall illicitly um, at college. It's probably more widespread now than it was back uh, when I went to college. But when I went to college, you could not only get, um, you know, illicitly obtained prescription amphetamines of all kinds of uh, doses, uh, spans, you know, dexedrine spansules with uh, little multicolored beads in them, but there was, they actually had, you may remember this, um, and this is the sort of the fiendishly clever marketing, um, there was a product called Dexameal, which is a combination of dexedrine, which is D-amphetamine, and amitol, which is amobarbital, which is a short intermediate act, acting barbiturate. So in one preparation, you could get the benefits of both an amphetamine and a barbiturate, which, you know, of course, to counteract the excessive stimulation from amphetamine. Um, uh, greater attention to manufacture, prescription regulations led to a decline in um, amphetamine use until um, we get to the uh, to around 1990, uh, where uh, now for the past um, close to 30 years, uh, there's been a second amphetamine and particularly methamphetamine epidemic. Um, 
So just uh, turning now to uh, epidemiology and, and going back to cocaine again, I'm, I'm not going to read through all these slides. They're there for your, um, for your benefit to look at. Um, the, uh, there was a steady decline in methamphetamine until 1991 and, and then a real um, increase uh, since then. Um, and what's really notable about the the increase and, and the differences in cocaine and, and methamphetamine epidemiologies uh, for which I certainly don't have good uh, explanations and I really haven't read terrific um, sort of integrative uh, explanations about the differences in the prevalence of cocaine versus methamphetamine use and then within cocaine even you know powder uh, versus crack cocaine, but cocaine and methamphetamine use big differences in geographic spread. So crack cocaine is all over the place. It's everywhere uh, in the U.S., probably maybe more so in urban areas. Uh, certainly there are um, uh, ethnic racial differences in crack cocaine use with um, possibly uh, less uh, uh, smokable crack cocaine use among uh, whites, more crack cocaine use uh, compared to powder cocaine among African Americans. With methamphetamine, um, it's been uh, much more white than um, African American. Uh, urban, but also to some degree rural, urban gay men, men who have sex with men first on the West Coast and later in New York City and um, all over the country have been particularly hard hit by the epidemic. Uh, and there's been a particularly strong connection of methamphetamine use with uh, risky sexual behavior, spread of HIV. Um, it's, it's taken a huge, uh, huge toll. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's gay men, certainly, in urban areas, poor rural whites in the southeast and the mid, in the uh, Midwest, um, much less so in the northeast. And bikers uh, in um, on the West Coast and elsewhere, um, Asian Americans in Hawaii on the West Coast, and of course there's an, an Asian Pacific uh, sort of nidus of uh, meth of methamphetamine use that goes back to World War II and extended into the 50s and 60s, and is thought to have resulted in the sort of west to east spread in the U.S. Although again, it, I don't I don't think this is uh, well understood and it, it would take a sociologist and ethnographer and I'm sure there are people who know more about this. Um, the, and again, just numbers for you to look at. Um, in 2015, and I'm sorry I don't have the most recent um, NSDUH, and NSDUH is really an important source for all of you. It's the National Survey of Drug Use um, and it's a community survey that takes place every year. Uh, we're, we're usually a year or two behind in the reporting of the most recent uh, survey. I think most recent survey currently available, 2017. These are 2015 numbers. And just for you to look at the uh, difference between numbers of past month. Now, this is just illicit. does not include tobacco or nicotine vape or um, alcohol and uh, coke and Cannabis is included as illicit because uh, it's federally illicit. But um, this is just the current prevalence of different illicit substance use in the U.S. And it shows that cocaine is the uh, third uh, most prevalent, uh, along with, uh, quote, with prescription, quote, tranquilizers, unquote, um, and methamphetamine is uh, a bit further down. Um, and uh, these are similar numbers for an actual diagnosis of substance use disorder as determined from this uh, NSDUH um, survey for current defined by past year um, substance use disorder with uh, this now includes um, alcohol uh, it does not, interestingly enough, include uh, tobacco or nicotine, but it shows the, C, the, the rank order with cocaine and methamphetamine being relatively um, equal here, uh, despite the fact that 
on the use uh, pattern, cocaine seems to be quite a bit more than methamphetamine. Um, and then substances for which the most current treatment was received in the past year. This is uh, in 2015 with cocaine being the gold uh, squares, uh, somewhat declining methamphetamine, the um, uh, teal colored or turquoise colored triangles somewhat increasing. Um, genetics, I'm really not gonna say much about genetics. Um, there's some recent uh, reviews that are cited here, uh, but um, complex and polygenic, that's about uh, you know, all that I can say. And uh, similarly for <laughs> methamphetamine, complex and polygenic. Uh, and genetics are something I don't have uh, expertise in and are the topic of an entire um, lecture because get into really interesting um, issues there in terms of which neuro genetics for which neurotransmitter systems, which um, circuits, uh, which uh, behaviors. Um, a little bit about diagnosis, and, and this is just a reminder that DSM-5 for cocaine and, um, and other stimulants, there are not just the use disorders and intoxication withdrawal, but then a range of, of substance-induced psychiatric disorders, which like all, all psychiatric disorders are really terribly crude descriptions of phenomena. Um, I'm always embarrassed, you know, talking about psychiatric diagnosis and treatment to non-psychiatrists um, or non-psychologists because we are still in 2019. I mean, if you look at all the, you know, stimulant-induced psychotic disorder, well, what is that? Well, gee, it's just like any other psychotic disorder except you've used stimulants within the last 30 days and you have some reason to think that you can't rule them out as the cause for the psychotic disorder and how's that defined? Well, certainly not by lab testing, imaging, uh, or anything else, but by someone telling you that they're seeing things or hearing things and having odd beliefs. Um, and anyway, enough said. Um, so uh, let's you know, just spend a moment on pharmacology. Um, and uh, so what are the actions of cocaine? Well, it's not simply increasing dopamine. Um, cocaine is a powerful um, sodium uh, channel uh, a moderating agent and, and probably produces its local anesthetic effects and also uh, possibly um, its uh, seizure-inducing effects uh, may have something to do with the uh, sodium channel blockade. Um, these are lidocaine effects. Lidocaine, of course, is a, an analog. It was synthesized to look like cocaine and to act like cocaine, but without the, um, the monoaminergic effects. Um, but, so uh, but clinically, we're sort of less concerned about the, um, about the sodium channel effects, except for the fact that you can have seizures with cocaine overdose, um, which can be difficult to, to control. But it's really the CNS stimulating effects that are you know, most salient to the clinical sorts of phenomena that we encounter with um, altered mental states and with addiction. So um, cocaine, as you probably know, blocks presynaptic um, monoamine reuptake sites, uh, transporters, pumps, these proteins on, um, on uh, the membranes in, on and in and under the membranes uh, of uh, CNS neurons, uh, dopaminergic, noradrenergic, serotonergic neurons, and all three of those uh, mono means um, have their reuptake uh, inhibited by uh, cocaine, and, and thus there's a lot of sympathetic nervous system stimulation. And as you would expect with you know any kind of exogenous ligand that we take long enough that we experience the the opposite effect. So just as much as we stimulate a neuronal system, we're going to create um, inhibition of, and down regulation of that system after a while, and then when we stop taking the drug, we're just left with our altered nervous system until um, it can recover. Um, and just in a very oversimplistic cartoon way, this um, 
figure demonstrates the key difference between the monoaminergic effects of, um, of cocaine versus methamphetamine, where cocaine, again, causes its, its um, intoxicating effects through acute reuptake inhibition and, and therefore an increase in the availability of mono means to the postsynaptic receptors. Uh, methamphetamine, however, has its effects on the um, intracytoplasmic vesicles that contain dopamine or noradrenaline or serotonin, and uh, methamphetamine uh, and uh, amphetamine cause uh, release. They can disrupt these vesicles, cause release of monoamines, e either at the cell surface or even intracytoplasmically. Um, and in any rate, there's a great increase of kind of like squeezing the toothpaste out of the tube, there's more release of um, dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, um, as opposed to the reuptake blockade by cocaine. Um, and it's thought that it's with uh, both cocaine and with uh, methamphetamine, increased dopamine in particular leads to increased um, attention and focus on um, the use of these drugs because of uh, increased reward and, um, and uh, increased, again, foc the focus of attention on rewarding stimuli. And, and it's important to remember that even after the um, intensity of the pleasure from repeated use of cocaine uh, wanes over with increased use, there is no reduction in the intensity of craving. So it's those attentional, the cue-induced craving, uh, attention, focus on seeking, finding, obtaining um, the reward, uh, that persists even as the rewarding effects of consumption diminish um, over time. Um, and lesions of mesolimbic dopamine circuits can um, abolish cocaine self-administration, um, but dopamine is not the only thing involved because um, there's evidence for reinforcement even in, in dopamine knockout mice. So cocaine affects many neuronal systems. Again, it's, and it's not just dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline, but uh, there are um, opioidergic, glutamatergic, uh, nicotinic, uh, GABAergic and uh, effects uh, even that involve cannabinoid receptors. Um, so the effects of all these drugs are complex, although we tend to think often for heuristic reasons of, of you know, one mechanism. And it is important to keep in mind uh, that it's the reuptake inhibition and dopamine is probably the key, but not alone. Just moving to kinetics, uh, metabolism of cocaine is by esterases, particularly benzoyl echignine, which is, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, with a, the result being the major metabolite, which is benzoyl echignine, uh, which is abbreviated BE. So when we're looking at <coughs> urine drug test results, and I'm sure Mike covered this just in the previous lecture, we're looking at benzoylecine, not for, not at the parent uh, cocaine. The half-life in plasma um, is about 45 minutes to about uh, an hour and a half, and it's much shorter, therefore, than what we see with uh, amphetamine and methamphetamine. Cocaine largely excreted in the urine with benzoylecine being by far the the metabolite that's in the highest um, concentration. And typical urine drug tests that use uh, enzyme-linked immunoassays, and again, Mike covered this. Um, usually, it, you have up, up to about three days. Occasionally, you can see cocaine up to five days out, but that's unusual. And then another interesting um, aspect of, uh, of the metabolism of cocaine that if one drinks a lot of alcohol together with cocaine use, there can be a, a trans esterification product called um, cocaethylene, which is thought to have some particularly potent cardiovascular and uh, behavioral 
irritability, um, potentiation effects. Um, with methamphetamine, major, uh, m most important thing is it's not um, esterases, but it's cytochrome P450 enzymes that are involved in the metabolism. So 2, 2D6, for example, is the major um, isoenzyme that takes uh, methamphetamine to amphetamine. Um, and uh, again, we've talked about the release of monoamines being the major pharmacologic route that leads to the CNS effects. There's some uh, minor monoamine oxidase inhibiting effects of, of amphetamine and methamphetamine as well. Um, and I think I've, I've already uh, said this, as well as the fact that there's, uh, just like with cocaine use, there's depletion of dopamine and other monoamines. With uh, methamphetamine use, um, there is also depletion uh, due to uh, different mechanisms, the excessive release of monoamines. There's also thought, there's some concern about greater toxicity potential with uh, for dopaminergic and serotonergic neurons with um, methamphetamine. Um, also, there's concern about MDMA in the same way because when um, there's disruption of intracytoplasmic vesicles that contain monoamines um, like dopamine, there's uh, some concern that there's an auto-oxidation process within the cytoplasm that can create oxidative products which can be um, destructive to serotonergic and uh, dopaminergic and noradrenergic um, neurons. Um, I'm really not aware of the latest research um, in terms of humans and animals on that. I know there's quite a bit of controversy uh, still about the MDMA um, neurotoxic effects. One important point, you know, we talked a lot about tolerance, how you get down regulation of, um, of the uh, uh, of monoaminergic systems, particularly dopamine, as you go um, further into cocaine and, um, and methamphetamine use disorder. Uh, but there's also a form of sensitization that occurs um, where um, particularly craving, again, not so much the the uh, consumatory response, but the seeking response. So craving and other behaviors are involved with drug seeking um, may be uh, increased in probably different, this is, probably, this is a, a kind of a heterogeneous phenomenon which may depend on different forms of genetic vulnerability of sensitization, uh, but sensitization appears to occur to craving uh, so that as people go through time, again, pleasure might reduce, but craving remains high and in effect can increase. Dysphoria, um, anxiogenic effects of cocaine in particular. Um, back about 30 years ago, uh, Rick Lannon and Alan Louie published um, on uh, in the American Journal of Psychiatry on cocaine-induced panic disorder, which seemed to persist even after discontinuation of, uh, of cocaine use. Um, psychosis, there's some suggestion that as you experience one episode of cocaine psychosis, it's easier to then experience a second episode uh, later. Similarly with seizures, that uh, a kindling type phenomenon um, thought to be related to increased glutamate um, uh, transmission in the nucleus accumbens um, and sort of a, a, an increase in the glutamatergic effects of, uh, of cocaine use. With methamphetamine, again, the big difference in kinetics is just longer acting, 11 to 12 hours uh, half-life, uh, and as I said, cytochrome P450 enzymes are involved. Um, you know, we use a lot of uh, medications in psychiatry that do affect P450 systems, uh, for example, 2D6, fluoxetine um, is a um, major substrate of that. Um, fluoxetine could then theoretically increase the, or the presence of methamphetamine 
versus amphetamine um, in the blood, but there's been no real clinical evidence of that, and uh, there's uh, been research, including research I did back in the um, 90s on fluoxine as a potential treatment for um, uh, methamphetamine, um, which, uh, and, and other research on sertraline uh, and other SSRs, which really has not shown any added toxicity. Uh, there's also been concern about ser you know, serotonin syndrome with combination of, uh, of amphetamine or methamphetamine and um, SSRIs and other antidepressants, but there really has not been an epidemic of serotonin syndrome uh, reported um, in association with the combined use. Um, so going back to roots of administration, I referred to this a little bit um, earlier. Um, in both cocaine and methamphetamine um, can be uh, used orally, um, intranasal insufflation, injection, either intravenous or um, subcutaneous or intramuscular. So with the injection, however, it's only the, the powder form of cocaine. So cocaine hydrochloride um, is water soluble, but when you remove that hydrochloride and, and leave the free base moiety, that no longer is water soluble, so it can't be, um, it can't be snorted, it can't be injected. Um, the injection route is, is within seconds, but the um, smoking route really rivals it in rapidity. And uh, these are just um, different uh, forms. And, and then this is a graph just to illustrate. And this is uh, research done by Reese Jones um, at UCSF back about 30 35 years ago, um, where uh, Reese compared uh, blood levels in the human lab of individuals who um, uh, snorted uh, cocaine um, versus uh, smoked uh, cocaine. And there are two uh, big differences. One is, of course, the amplitude of blood level that you get with, uh, with smoking is much higher than the peak level that you get with roughly equivalent um, amounts that are intranasally used. But the other very important, what's the other big difference other than the amplitude? What, what else differs about those two graphs, those two lines? The slope, yeah. So, and you know, how do we feel, what, what determines how high we feel when we take a substance? Is it just blood or brain level? Or are there other factors too? Whether it's alcohol or cocaine or other drugs, what's the other big factor other than how much is in your blood or brain at any moment? The, the change. The change, it's right. So much the level you reach as how fast you can get there. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and uh, so change in general, and how, and as Dr. Banz pointed out, the rate of change. So um, you can get the same blood level by uh, drinking alcohol on a full stomach or on an empty stomach, but you'll get much more drunk um, on you know the latter because you get to that blood level much quicker, and that's that rate that's perceived. Um, staying at the same blood level, you start feeling less intoxicated. Now there are lots of reasons for that, um, including some acute tolerance effects and so on, but. But the rate of change is huge, and that's in addition to the level are what makes um, inhaling a drug, whether it's nicotine um, or cocaine or alcohol. Alcohol can be inhaled through a vapor. Um, in the U.S., that's um, illegal to provide alcohol in those forms. It actually, there were some efforts to market um, inhalable alcohol. Uh, but in, inhaling rivals uh, injection use. So uh, just a reminder, by the way, there are medical uses for stimulants, as you probably know, for cocaine, for um, the amphetamine type stimulants, and they're uh, scheduled, um, as scheduled two. Um, the subjective effects, I don't think I need to go through. I think you're probably um, all quite aware um, of these, uh, 
and the um, effects that are more somatic with uh, sympathomimetic effects and um, toxic, uh, toxic effects of both cocaine and methamphetamine of super high doses can lead to sort of neuroleptic malignant syndrome type situations with hyperthermia, rigidity, seizures. I think Pai may have gone to some of this stuff in uh, discussing the medical effects of substances. Uh, and then withdrawal. Um, and, uh, you know, this is really, the history of this is really interesting. And, and Frank Gavin and um, Ellenwood's paper uh, from 1988 is cited here. Because uh, Gavin, who was an early cocaine researcher, um, uh, at Yale uh, was among the first to, to really um, describe in a detailed way withdrawal from cocaine. And back in the late 70s, actually back in the mid 70s um, and earlier, I remember when I was in medical school, there was actually a tr real controversy about was cocaine addictive? Because addiction at that time was defined really in this, almost in the sense of what we now call pharmacological dependence, so tolerance and withdrawal. And how is withdrawal defined? It was defined very narrowly as peripherally observable withdrawal, not CNS withdrawal where people complain of dysphoria, craving, et cetera, et cetera. No, withdrawal was what you could see on uh, you know, vital signs. So opioids, barbiturates, alcohol, you know, clearly were recognized to be addictive in that they caused withdrawal that you could see, but cocaine didn't. Cocaine just, you know, made people depressed, grumpy, tired, etc. cetera. Um, and it took a while for that to be conceptualized as a withdrawal syndrome. Um, and this withdrawal syndrome um, really can present and look like a whole bunch of acute psychiatric disorders if you're not looking at time course, if you just look at a slice in time. And this is studies, an early study um, from inpatient uh, clinical cocaine treatment uh, back around 1990, the late 80s, people, you could hospitalize people for like up to a month for, uh, there's quite a, a brisk business in doing that. I think French hospital in here in San Francisco, had an inpatient, and lots of yeah, programs. The I most important uh, diagnostic test was a wallet biopsy. <laughs> <laughs> so insurance covered uh, being in for you know cocaine treatment for a, a month. Um, uh, but anyway, the point of this slide is to show that um, these different um, the different graphs are different. I think these are all subsets of the palms, the profile of mood states. Um, with except for the uh, depressions by Beck, but essentially what it shows is that people are really dysphoric in the first few days that they come in with cocaine abstinence, and during that time they'll complain of fatigue and tension and depression and so on and so forth. And um, the point of the Weddington study was to show that these symptoms resolve really pretty quickly within the first week uh, or so, and that uh, one needs to defer make you know any attempts at making um, non-stimulant related uh, diagnoses until a week or two after uh, cessation of use. Um, these are just some examples of uh, clinical presentation. With methamphetamine, often there's a binge pattern um, and the amount can range really enormously with a logarithmic uh, range of doses uh, from 10 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams uh, or more in a day because tolerance develops so rapidly. All sorts of routes of administration, um, uh, oral injection, uh, rectal, smoke. And, it, and a, uh, an important distinction between methamphetamine and cocaine is that um, smoked methamphetamine is not the free base uh, form as cocaine is the free-based smokable crack form. Uh, with methamphetamine, if it's pure enough, you can smoke the uh, crystal uh, methamphetamine hydrochloride because its melting point is lower. The reason that with cocaine you have to um, free-base it and make it into crack to smoke it is because the cocaine hydrochloride powder 
um, its melting point is somewhat above its sort of burning and degradation point. So the mo molecule degrades at the temperatures needed to aerosolize it. Whereas if you take the hydrochloride away, the, the free base cocaine melts and aerosolizes, volatilizes, and is available for, for inhalation um, at lower temperatures. With crystal meth also, the melting point is lower and you can aerosolize it, volatilize it, and inhale it without having to go through the you know, awkward process of, of free basing it or creating uh, the crack equivalent of, uh, of methamphetamine. Um, and again, uh, as with uh, cocaine, the effects you know, get worse the more you use them, the longer you use them. And the beneficial, uh, the effects that are perceived as beneficial transform into effects that are not so beneficial um, after a while. Um, and I, I can't remember right now how much uh, pie covered of you know the medical effects, but I'm just gonna you can look at your slides. But again, the major problems with are due to CNS stimulation and to a variety of cardiovascular and CNS effects. Um, what really is a major problem with cocaine is that you combine a bunch of sort of synergistic bad effects on the CNS and the circulatory environment, including a big increase in um, the uh, dynamic activity of the heart, so a lot of increase in contractility, cardiac output, but then you're pressing all that blood against a constricted vascular bed, and so there's a much higher chance of having a stroke, and you're also, uh, at the same time, making blood stickier and uh, making the lining of blood vessels um, rougher and more swollen and therefore more likely for clot production. Uh, so all of these uh, factors um, with um, the hypertension, um, increased myocardial workload, platelet activation, coronary vasospasm because of the potent vasoconstrictive effects, the sodium channel blockade and the resultant um, vulnerability to arrhythmias, um, so all of these can lead to, uh, to really to fatal cardiovascular, um, renal, CNS effects. Many many different ways to, to die from cocaine, um, and then there are just some chronic effects of know, having. Um, have one patient right now um, at uh, in residential treatment who. A uh, woman in her mid 50s who came in with her nose literally, you know, twice the width that it normally was due to uh, edema, uh, uh, tissue damage, um, loss of uh, a big septal defect, chronic um, nose bleeding um, from uh, really severe intranasal cocaine use, but then all of the uh, all the other uh, effects of injection use, all the infectious disease. Important also keep in mind that that sharing of intranasal insufflation equipment like straws or things that people use to snort drugs through can cause micro lacerations in the um, blood vessels in the nasal lining. And for hep C, you need a really pretty small inoculum, um, much less than you do for HIV. Hep C is very transmissible for that reason. Um, Levamisole, I'm not sure if Pi mentioned it, but it's the now well-known contaminant that uh, for God knows what reason is um, was picked by people who are large cocaine dealers to cut cocaine with. And I, I haven't done a close enough review to find out what is you know what are the physical chemical properties of levamisole, which you know, of all the white powders that you could pick, you know, why, why that? But um, it uh, causes uh, severe uh, problems and there's a citation and more recent uh, reviews of this are also available um, and um, there are far the this slide actually still refers to a pretty old reference so there are many more cases than what were cited there um, methamphetamine similar uh, but you get less uh, vasoconstriction than we than you do with cocaine but but basically similar effects the 
um, seizure-inducing property of methamphetamine appears to be considerably less than that of cocaine. Again, probably due to the lack of that sodium channel in, in that um, of effect that um, that lidocaine-like effect of cocaine is not seen with uh, with methamphetamine. Uh, but perhaps a little bit more concern about what I mentioned before in terms of uh, loss of serotonergic or dopaminergic um, neurons, um, and psychosis is really seems to be more uh, easily induced by amphetamine than cocaine. Um, and I, you know, there are probably some, but I'm not aware of these uh, investigations that may go into, anybody have any thoughts or ideas about why that may be? Um, I honestly don't know why methamphetamine is so much more inductive of psychosis. Uh, but I sure see a lot of it, and I'm sure you have too, um, and there's so much we don't know about methamphetamine psychosis. Um, and, and one of the most important things is that the literature over and over, clinical literature, not so much research literature, basically says that a persistent psychosis in somebody who's not using, uh, you know, it's unroofed schizophrenia. And I just don't think that's true. I think that they have a fairly isolated paranoid thought disorder, but they don't have the other hallmarks of schizophrenia. And but when you read the literature, you'll see it all the time, that this is a the precipitate uh, pushed you over the schizophrenia cliff. And it's, uh, it's not the experience I had here at the VA, where we have a subset of people who stay crazy, and they just go month after month, year after year, with this kind of um, narrowly focused piece of craziness, paranoid ideation, auditory hallucinations. They keep their sense of humor. They keep their marriages. They but they still work. think their phone is hacked. Yeah, yeah. 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 But they yeah. don't have like the disorganization yeah. of language, they don't have like yeah. the bizarre behaviors or yeah. dress or you know, negative effects. And, and as Peter and Mike are saying, this is increasingly recognized that it is one of the, there's, so there's a heterogeneous spectrum of uh, meth-induced uh, psychosis, more so than with cocaine. There's much more persistent psychosis with methamphetamine. Most of the best studies, recent studies, have been Japanese studies that look at cohorts um, that definitely uh, indicate that one, that there's this one end of the spectrum where you have a chronic, and there are two forms of the, that increased uh, psychosis uh, vulnerability. One is people who um, use methamphetamine, uh, get psychotic, and then keep using methamphetamine and keep getting psychotic with lower and lower uh, doses, and that goes for cocaine too. Then there are people who use methamphetamine, get psychotic, goes away, it comes back without reuse, and then people use methamphetamine, get psychotic, and stay psychotic. And all three of those sorts of variants uh, have been seen. What we don't know when you have the first episode is how long do you treat with antipsychotics? And uh, to my knowledge, there are still no large studies that have methodically tried, you know, like two week, three month, and continued. Um, and we don't have good predictors. I mean, you can look at all the usual predictors, family history, pre-morbid, uh, et cetera. It's particularly difficult, as it is with cannabis-induced psychosis, if you're in that age range where you really don't know if what you're seeing is, um, you know, the f first div onset of what would have happened anyway, even without cannabis or stimulant use in a, let's say, a 21-year-old, um, or uh, whether it's something that is a vulnerability but would not have been expressed without cannabis or meth methamphetamine, or whether it's totally kind of de novo created. And the most likely explanation with methamphetamine um, in response to the description, as Peter did, of the different types of patterns that we see with um, acute becoming chronic is that there are uh, thought to be differences in the subserving systems, um, dopamine systems, um, et cetera, in uh, individuals who get uh, persistent or recurring. You know, the other uh, big diagnostic boggle is a uh, young person goes into an emergency room, uh, flying high, uh, leaves with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, and ends up on two mood stabilizers. And it's all meth, you know. And, and now you've got to untangle all that. You know, something. Yeah. And everybody would rather have one thing than another, you know. They're all looking for medication, and uh, it's it's difficult. But you get a lot of bad diagnoses in, in urgent care settings. Yeah. 
and, and multiple medication starts. Um, so premature rupture of membranes is among the most widely agreed upon uh, effects of uh, cocaine. Um, the developmental effects are, are more difficult to um, adequately uh, summarize and I still haven't seen, I think, as good a review as the 2001 JAMA review. Um, the 2010 uh, review, uh, in a sort of a long-term follow-up, uh, did find um, that they were uh, re sustained attention and behavioral self-regulation um, problems that seemed to be different, that, that seemed to be attributable to the uh, prenatal cocaine exposure. What's been difficult about all these studies is that it's very difficult to get um, histories where the only thing that went wrong in somebody's mm -hmm. prenatal experience was maternal cocaine use as opposed to maternal tobacco use or poverty or malnutrition or head trauma or um, abuse or whatever. And uh, this research is really, really difficult to do. It takes very large numbers and fancy math. Uh, there were a couple of years in which the national media picked up on this notion of crack babies. And that crack babies allegedly were the babies that were tomorrow's future crack addicts mm -hmm. and violent people in society. Some of these women, when they tested positive during pregnancy, were prosecuted for child abuse before their baby was born in states like South Carolina. Um, and when the research started coming out, you really couldn't show these downstream effects. But this, this took hold of the public for about two years. And, and it was driven by the media more than anybody else. Yeah. Now, nowadays, the prosecution is more for opioid use during uh, pregnancy in, in southern states or uh, quite a few prosecutions. Um, so treatment, um, and uh, it's appropriate that we only have a few minutes left for that because really that's pretty much all it takes in terms of certainly the um, pharmacological uh, side of things because we have no pharmacological and treatments. God, we've been trying right. for a long time. Yes, we've been trying. I for remember when dezipramine was a cure yeah. for about five minutes. Yep. Um, yeah, I first started doing research in this area in 1986 and, um, yeah, you know, research has been going on since about 83 um, and all the antidepressants, anticonvulsants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we really don't, still don't really have anything. So psychosocial treatments are still the mainstay with contingency management being possibly the strongest. And um, there's, you can look through the, you know, the slides for further references. Uh, this is the NIDA collaborative study um, from about 20 years ago. Um, Voucher-based incentives research for over the last 20 years on this has shown uh, efficacy and we have a contingency management system here that um, Chris Galloway runs and folks in OTP and in DAT and IOP um, have access to uh, contingency management. Um, this, uh, I think this is still the most recent Cochrane review of, uh, over a decade ago now about psychosocial treatments um, and basically showing that cognitive behavioral treatments with contingency management seem to be best. With methamphetamine, um, uh, similar approaches uh, have been used, and I'll let you just um, look at, uh, uh, by the way, acupuncture, uh, while it makes everybody feel better, there's, there does not appear to be any effect over sham acupuncture for uh, stimulant use disorder. And in terms of pharmacological treatment, um, there's acute intoxication treatment, uh, there's no real treatment that seems to be effective for withdrawal. Um, dopaminergic agents like the indirect dopamine agonist amantadine uh, were tried in the past, but not really helpful. Many medications have been tried, um, and uh, there's uh, a bunch of reviews here that are cited for the major drug classes that have been tried. Um, uh, including stimulants, and you know, probably the best evidence right now is for things like, like bupropion, or believe it or not, dextroamphetamine, or modafinil. But but even that evidence is slim. Um, and uh, you know, I 
probably use bupropion more than uh, anything else. Of the sort of stimulating types of medications, um, and um, uh, disulfram, uh, because uh, disulfram, as the Cochrane review said, there's there's low evidence, which is better than no evidence. <laughs> low low evidence is pretty darn good in this whole <laughs> domain. Um, and and uh, disulfram, um, and anyone know what the putative mechanism of disulfram in for cocaine? And it's not by reducing the amount of alcohol. Well, that that helps, but. No, I'm not sure if that's involved, but it's thought to be the, the dopamine beta hydroxylase inhibition with disulfam. So disulfam is an acid aldehyde dehydrogenase inhibitor. That's what we use it for. But it also has dopamine beta hydroxylase inhibition effects, and therefore it's thought to increase central dopamine and reduce noradrenaline a little bit. So, um, but there is there is some evidence better than for most other things. Um, amphetamine intoxication. Um, for both amphetamine and cocaine intoxication, when it's accompanied by agitated psychosis, um, it's important to not just use a high-potency dopamine antagonist like haloperidol uh, or even maybe risperidone without using lots of benzodiazepine. And benzodiazepine probably should be the first thing both for cocaine and for methamphetamine because you want to make sure people don't um, sees and you want to reduce the chance of rigidity of a, an NMS type of uh, episode. Um, and there's been a review of methamphetamine psychosis uh, in the Cochrane uh, collaboration, uh, methamphetamine withdrawal, uh, no medications effective. Um, so for methamphetamine, again, a, a similar list of you know the usual suspects in terms of drugs that have been tried to um, help reduce relapse uh, to methamphetamine. Virtually none of them have worked, although there's been a little bit of uh, evidence for uh, bupropion, for modafinil, um, and more recently for uh, mirtazapine um, and naltrexone, although most recently, um, uh, including a study that we did here in San Francisco and that was published a couple of years ago, um, in addiction, extended release naltrexone did not work better than placebo in a fairly large study of men who have sex with men, um, methamphetamine users. Um, so uh, no pharmacological treatments are, uh, are known to be uh, helpful. Again, I'm listing some of the, um, some of the promising uh, studies. The mirtazapine, um, this is from the mirtazapine study um, in um, 2011, uh, which showed in an N equals 60 study, uh, again with men who have sex with men, uh, Grant Colfax, who's now our current new uh, uh, director of health here in San Francisco, um, authored that, and then we've done a replication study um, that um, is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is the, uh, this is the extended release naltrexone study, which showed no benefit um, in, uh, uh, in the, published this a couple of years ago. Um, it, and this was really disappointing because there had been all this promising Scandinavian literature with naltrexone for, with oral naltrexone for amphetamine uh, use disorder. Uh, but when we tried the extended release form for methamphetamine, it, it showed, you know, really, Steve, were you careful to separate out uh, compulsive dependence from uh, recreational use for sex? Because a huge prevailing pattern, uh, at least in the Bay Area, is to, it's, it's just uh, sex aid uh, on weekends. They're not busy doing it Monday through Friday. They use it on the weekends. Yeah. And it's basically, you know, along with vitamin D, Viagra, it's just part of the cocktail for, for yeah. sex drugs. No, I mean, they're, you know, really all, anybody you met, Disorder use disorder criteria, all kind of lumped, lumped I think together. They're different uh, cohort of people. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's like Viagra for them. Yeah. It's what you see in circuit. But, circuit but you know, the, but quite often the, the use is still um, you know binge pattern, not not every day. So I mean, I would argue about how 
you know, salient those distinctions are. But I, you know, there's so many, I mean, it, for all substances, we have such heterogeneity and in patterns of use. Um, ultimately, for these studies, we, you know, recruitment is always a problem. You just do the best you can. The best you can. Um, and, you know, one th point I want, at the bottom of this slide, uh, mirtazapine, for so the Grant Colfax study from um, 2011. So we finished the, the replication, um, a NIDA funded study here, again with men who have sex with men, larger study uh, in, in San Francisco, and we're, that paper's in, um, in uh, press right now. Uh, but there was mirtazapine, the, the beneficial effect held up, but it's modest. It's like maybe a 30% uh, reduction over placebo. So it's absolutely nothing to, it's something you publish, but it's nothing to write home about. Oh, it's um, a nice drug when you got a sleep disorder yeah. in early sobriety. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And and there doesn't seem to be any harm. And weight gain problems are not so much of a problem when you're a methamphetamine user. So, uh, <laughs> nor are the sedation <laughs> problems. So. You know, and, and we have to kind of drill down on, you know, is there any way to, you know, were there subsets that did better? Um, are there ways to enhance the effect by combination with other substances? Um, but still, stimulant use disorders remain remarkably recalcitrant to, uh, you know, to pharmacotherapy. Um, Got and, a sidebar question. Yeah. We've got a room full of people, some of whom have children and some of whom will have children. How concerned should we be about the the, the standard stimulant drugs that are used for ADHD, you know, Adderall, uh, you know, methamphetamine, so on, uh, bone development, cognitive development, uh, other forms of uh, physiological maturation. Uh, some of the, some of these drugs begin when you're, you know, you, your bones haven't closed, you're you're not reached your full growth, and you're a kid, you know, trying to get through yeah. grade school. Uh, is, are there things that we should be paying attention to that we don't seem to hear? I, I, I think you've named all of them, and I, I would say I probably know very much a little more beyond what you just said. No, that these are anything. these I'm are things. I'm asking you. These are things we should be concerned about. Um, you know, unfortunately, I'm I'm not a pediatrician or a, a developmental expert, and I certainly you know don't know anything about um, the the relative uh, harms versus the, the harms of let's say severe untreated ADD or ADHD. All I know is that like PTSD and lots of other things, ADD and ADHD are way overdiagnosed, and everybody has it, and, um, or everybody wants to at least convince somebody that they have it you know, when they get older. Um, so I, you know, I really can't say much, much about that. And we do have a child and adolescent trained psychiatrist in the room, so what, yeah. what did you guys learn yeah. about stimulants I can and start by you. arguing first that ADHD is both over and underdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. Good so point. Probably misdiagnosed yeah. frequently. Secondly, um, there's actually just a Lancet 2019 uh, meta-analysis that looked at the risk of methylphenidate and risk of causing psychosis, because uh, there's been some publication around that, and that's not substantiated according to their article. And there was also, in January of this year, I can't remember who, where it was published, um, looking at amphetamines compared to methylphenidates mm -hmm. for the risk of psychosis. And, and much more. Are yeah. much more at risk. There's burgeoning evidence, actually, like brain imaging studies that suggest that actually the treatment of ADHD and adequately and inappropriately diagnosed with pharmacologic treatment during a critical period, and that is still being determined what exactly that means, may have uh, sort of like an inverse correlation with negative outcomes in the future, whether that's around substance use, uh, great level of achievement, um, employment opportunities, with early treatment during that phase with stimulants, you know, rather than what's being what suggested. You're saying it's protective. Yes. And there's also like some evidence that probably treating ADHD may not be preventative from for development of substance use disorder, but may reduce rates a little bit. Yeah, and there's pretty good, um, consistent um, evidence from studies that there's no worsening of substance use in future uh, in, in folks treated with stimulants. But uh, you know, I don't have good answers for all the concerns you raised. Any other comments or questions that folks have about cocaine and methamphetamine? I know this is pretty a broad, broad swath of um, of information about these drugs. I'm just wondering about the cocaine vaccine that they talked about. Okay, um, yeah, and I'm sorry, I didn't. You know, it's it's still in it's been in experimental stage for a 
15 years now. <laughs> and Tom Costin, uh, currently at Baylor, um, has been the main proponent of that. The work is still on, you know, just ongoing. Take, just take more, okay? Yeah. <laughs> That's the solution. If it's not enough, take more. That's what you do when you have tolerance. Gee, it didn't work. I'll take some more. Oh, in, in response to the yeah. vaccine, yeah. Yeah, you know, does it reduce craving? I'm not sure. I mean, in trials, there's reduction of use, but there have been so many problems with the immunogenicity, the uh, safety. Um, there's still no real clear answer to that. That work is ongoing. I have a comment. I just want to bring to your attention something that you don't see in America. You don't run around using the term ATS here, do you? Uh, amphetamine type stimulants. This is a term that America is promoting all over the world. The, the DEA and uh, various U.S. federal agencies that fund uh, drug efforts all around the world. And what they've done is they've bundled in uh, MDMA in with the drugs we're discussing today. And what it has become in many places, particularly Southeast Asia, is a full employment plan for criminal justice. Um, in my view, the best uh, way to think of uh, drugs like MDMA and uh, ketamine is club drugs. They have a different use pattern. They don't tend to have a sort of compulsive uh, run on uh, Dependence pattern, the recreational uh, MDMA is the hug drug, you know, the love drug, and uh, and the pattern is very different. It tends to be a young population, but it's a great way to arrest kids. In um, in Saigon, in one raid at a dance club, one thousand kids were arrested and drug tested, and um, and then a very high proportion of them were released after their parents paid a fee. The parents paid a large fee for the drug testing. If you get what I get my drift. <laughs> uh, so, just be aware that our government is doing things that, uh, and it does make sense from a chemistry structure. The structural reason why they're called ATSs is that there's a similarity in the molecular design, but the clinical presentations and the clinical risks are vastly different. But now they've been bundled. Now, the other thing that you begin to see is that you begin to see national guidelines uh, in these countries in which all of the stuff that you're presenting about methamphetamine is now attached to uh, MDMA and ketamine as if they're the same darn mm -hmm. thing. So it creates a real mess. Um, and, and there are vested interests in all that. 